What has been the experience so far? Well, um, let me thank the organizers for inviting me, and uh, it's really a privilege to be here. We do realize in government that we have to make deliberate policies and take deliberate actions to make sure that there's more inclusiveness of women in every facet of our society, not just in government, but in every facet of our society. And um, during the COVID, it became very, very glaring that whether it's the impact of COVID or impact of climate change or economic slowdown, that the most affected people are actually women. So in designing any policy, whether it's fiscal, monetary, or trade, we have to consciously take into account how does this affect women. And we, we found a way to cause that to happen in Nigeria. First of all, when we were designing the economic sustainability plan to support us during the, um, during the COVID period, we designed a cluster of programs and we, we, we required that each program should have at least 50% of the beneficiaries to be women. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the targets that was set for every uh, agency of government that was provided with funding to implement the economic sustainability plan. Then in, in our national budget, we also made a provision to en ensure that MDAs consciously look at their programs and projects with the gender lens. So you need to be asking, how can I implement this program in a way that women will benefit, whether it is road construction mm. or economic empowerment. For example, when we developed the social register to be able to provide support to the most vulnerable in the society, we ended up having a situation, even before the COVID, that 92% of the caregivers on our social register that is meant to provide cash transfers to people are women. And also we found out that when we provided small loans to very small businesses, mm. that performance of the loans from the women in terms of recovery is about 99%. Yes. So it, it just meant to us that taking care of what the women need is actually a very wise economic decision. You're able to get more mileage for whatever limited resources that you have. So we're doing that in every sector of the economy and we're beginning to see the results. We've designed a monitoring framework that enables uh, agencies of government to, to report to us with data in a disaggregated format so we see what the outcomes are of the plans and the funding that we have uh, deployed. Well, thank you very much for your opening comments. And I think that's a very important point that you make and it's well articulated. It's not just important and imperative to bank on women. Women are also good to bank with. And I think that is the experience that the financial sector will certainly validate. Minister Irani, let me address that same issue with you. You know, we just heard here from the minister from Nigeria talking about the need for financial inclusion, access to credit. There are several measures that the Indian government has already put in place, opening banks bank accounts, for instance, the mudra scheme, for instance, for the benefit of our uh, participants here and those who are watching, it is a scheme to try and ensure that there is access to credit for women who are looking at creating their own enterprises. How has the journey been so far? But more importantly, as we look ahead, uh, given the context of the setbacks that we have seen through the course of the pandemic and the disproportionate impact it's had on women, what more needs to be done? Shireen, you began this conversation with a very ominous figure on the wall, which is 151 years needed to bring about parity and economic participation by women. How do you arrive at that number? Which level of economic participation or empowerment do you measure to reach that number? Let me give you an Indian context. We are a billion plus society, of which 1.35 billion is the population, of which 1.3 billion Indians now have a digital identity, men and women equally so. We are a 700 million literate people, of which 600 million are in the workforce, men and women included, some in the organized sector, some in the unorganized sector. When you talk about fiscal services, we need to see what did India do pre-pandemic, because not much uh, can be spoken of post-pandemic or as we've transitioned out of pandemic uh, from a gender perspective justly without recognizing what happened before the pandemic. Now, in the year 2014, the Prime Minister said that in a billion-plus society, we have close to 400 million people who are unbanked. 
uh, out of which 220 million were women. The banks reached out for the first time in India. No individual walked up to a bank branch. Banking correspondents reached out to our society at large at zero deposits, opened up bank accounts for 440 million Indians, of which 220 million were women. Now, you speak about Mudra Yojana. It was not a gendered fiscal service. Mudra Yojana was basically a financial service where up to a million rupees for small industry, cottage industry, that credit support without collateral was proposed by the government. There was no subscription that this would be the agency of only women. Yeah. What surprised people in the fiscal world was that 70% of the 320 million loans given out were taken by women. Which means many recognize that at the entry level of enterprise, you have a female talent, which by that time was appearing to be unrecognized. Then we came to a stage where we said, if we want to provide support fiscally for mid-sized companies, the startup regime, should we do this again, not a gendered financial service, but Stand Up India came about. Nobody expected that 80% of the beneficiaries will turn out to be women. Which means that in a world which is talking about, and especially in Davos, where we speak about skilling, reskilling, this was a latent talent which was unrecognized. Women had the skill sets to draw up a business plan, go to a bank, convince the banking sector of their business potential. And as ministers rightly said, even in India, the NPA is 1% or less. Which means when you support the agency of women, what do you support? It makes fiscal sense, yep. it is societally empowering, and it is civilizationally beneficial. Again, I'll go back to the number that you have pronounced here. How does India feature in that gap in dice? Which part of Indian womanhood is not recognized in that indice? You speak about political power. I have 1.4 million women who get elected to office in the grassroots structure of governance, which is up and these are women who spend money from the Indian Treasury on issues which impact not only women's issues, but also society at large, looking at infrastructure, the grassroots, health, education. They don't get recognized in that indice. It's as though they don't exist. I have 15 million women today in India who sit in administrative governance positions who don't get recognized by the indice. Do they not exist? They very well do. I have 80 million women in India who handle singularly close to $32 billion worth of credit for themselves as a coalition. They skill themselves digitally and physically on many issues. They are a part of a supply chain of craft, of agro-processing. They don't figure there because they are not large industrial houses to sit at tables such as this and say, we matter. We keep the economic wheels turning. So when you put money behind the agency of women, is it only enough to do so fiscally? Mm. What are the um, human development issues on which if you put that money on infrastructure, particularly supporting women, that it'll have a GDP impact? So again, I turn the clock back to 2014 when the Prime Minister said from the ramparts of the Red Fort, if we speak of gender justice, can we start by building toilets for women? Now, no man in my country, and I'm sure I can speak for many democracies across the world, would ever stand on Independence Day and say, let's build toilets for women. It's not politically glamorous, but my Prime Minister did. We built 110 million individual household toilets for women. Now, if you look at the fiscal impact, in 2013, the World Bank report said that due to the lack of sanitation facilities, there is a negative 6% impact on our GDP. So while this looked like a pronounced intervention for women's health and sanitation, it had an impact on the economy as a whole. So I think that if we are looking at the cause of women to be served, we need to recognize, and we have set an example in India, that... It cannot be siloed, only fiscal, only academic, only skill. It has to be a holistic enterprise. Go 
Okay, that is our managing editor in conversation with Smriti Zubin Irani, who is the Minister of Women and Child Development of India. And of course, a lot more esteemed panelists as well. Of course, we'll keep getting your excerpts from that conversation. But for now, we have run out of time on this edition of Mutual Fund Corner. But stay tuned. All the market action on Closing Bell that comes up next.